you weren't with us uh, last night, Brother Randy Newcomer kicked off our meeting with a great message, and uh, he's going to finish up here this morning. He pastors the Central Baptist Church in Canton, Ohio, and they've got great public ministry there, the Pro Football Hall of Fame and other events. They work for the Lord, and uh, we're just always glad to have Randy and his wife with us. So. First John chapter 3, while I get my mouth watered. There was one great message last night and one good message, so now we know. I guess. Sorry, brother. God's good. So now we just got to wake up and get going. Lights were out and got to see the movie and all that stuff. So y'all ready? Here we go. First John chapter 3, and I'll read my text, verse 8 through 10. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. One more prayer, God, thank you for the opportunity to be in church. So we're thankful for what we've heard this morning already. Lord, we are so thankful for you being our Heavenly Father. What an amazing blessing. We sure appreciate it. Help us now, God, to focus. We are here. Lord, help us to listen on purpose. And Lord, I pray that you'd bless this preaching, Lord, to the nourishment of our souls as you would see fit in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. He that committeth sin, the verse says, is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. Sin is a characteristic of the devil, not of God. So if the verses that uh, were preached this morning by Brother Carlson talked about sin, sin, sin. This ver- these verses, you see the repeated uh, word, the devil, of the devil, the devil, of the devil. Four times you see the devil and of the devil. Every time we see sin, it's a characteristic of the devil. Whenever my oldest son was young, my wife can remember many times uh, having him in the grocery cart going through the store and pushing him in. He would look over at someone and he said, oh, mom, he's got yucky stuff in his cart. Or she's got yucky stuff in her cart as they would see the alcohol in the, in the cart. And I guess that should be our attitude when we see things. Oh, that's yucky stuff. Sin the, uh, of the devil. And, you know, every time we see sin, it's a characteristic of the devil. It can't be of God because there's no sin in God. Verse uh, 5 told us that. Um, you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Go over to the book of John. So just looking at this characteristic of the devil being sin, and we're talking about trying to live our life in a righteous way, we need to see that you know, we don't want to choose the devil over God. John chapter 10 Jesus Christ said in verse 9, he said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief, referencing, referencing the devil, cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy the thief, the devil. He's a stiller. He's a killer. He's a destroyer. 1 Corinthians 10.10 calls the devil the destroyer. Look over at John chapter 8. So we're looking at, there's, there's two families. The Bible talked to, Jesus is talking to these religious people who are not saved. And everyone who's not saved, this verse can apply to them. John eight forty four, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. 
He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he's a liar and the father of it. So these two sins summarize the character of the devil and his goals. He, he, he works, his work is to see people destroyed and lost and to go to hell. That's murder. And then he desires to deceive them into that destruction, and that's lying to deceive them away from God. Now in our text, back over in 1 John, it said, back over there in verse 8, 3, 8, He that committeth sin is of the devil. The devil sinneth from the beginning. So then we find out, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now we know the, the works of the devil show up in the Garden of Eden when, when, when Satan deceived Eve and led her into disobedience. And then as a result, Satan sinned and threw all humanity, as, as we know, into the bondage of sin. And wherefore, as by one man sinned into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And as a result, then, Adam's sin, that sin nature comes upon mankind, and Satan lied to Eve with the goal of murdering her and, and separating her from God. You eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. And so he started out with these works. He wanted humanity to die. So in summary, the works of the devil are counter to the works of God. And so we, we see this devil and this, this attribute that that is anti-God, anti-Christ. As a murderer, Satan works against Christ, who is the life. As a liar, Satan works against God, and God is the truth. So there's this, this opposite thing. So in the lives of believe, unbelievers, the work of the devil is to do whatever he can um, to keep them from coming to a saving grace, uh, a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, which will result in their eternal death. In the life of believers, the work of the devil then is to lie about God and his ways and to, to tempt us and to uh, get us to follow his ways, which would blunt our effectiveness that God would have for us as his children. So there's this, there's this parallel going on. Um, contention amongst the brethren. We're going to be talking about that as we go on in the passage about loving and this and that and church divisions. I read this interesting story about in World War II, the Russians, they enlisted um, dogs, and they trained these dogs, and they, they'd strap bombs on them, and they trained these dogs to go under German tanks, and then they would blow up the German tanks. So if you're a dog lover and PETA and all this stuff, they did it to save their nation. So they did this thing, and I, I read that actually in the history of the battles, those dogs destroyed 304 German tanks. Interesting. I mean, it worked. But when they were first training these dogs, they trained them with Russian tanks. And the Russian tanks used diesel fuel, and the German tanks used gasoline. So whenever the dogs would be go, go out first to attack, they would get confused, and they would go back to the Russian tanks that had the diesel, and there was a lot of problems until those dogs got retrained in their smelling. And I'm thinking, you know, whose side are you on? <laughs> this is the thought for Christian. Whose side are you on? Are you on God's side? Or are you on the devil's side? Right. And this is this, this whole principle back and forth over and over of the devil or of God, sinful or of righteousness. And we, we see these things, these choices. And Brother Carlson laid out some reasons why we should choose God. But he wants to keep us, the devil wants to keep us from, you know, what's our primary purpose for existence? Our primary purpose for existence, we're, we're to please God. We're, we're created for His glory. We're to bring, uh, bring honor. We're to have fellowship with God now. We're to live a life that is a light to other people. And so His, his name is, 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 uh, is good and we can be empowered to witness. Now notice back over at 1 John chapter 3, it says... He that committeth sin is of the devil. So just get this in your head. First of all, you choose to sin. At that point, you are choosing the devil who hates your guts. You're choosing the destroyer, the evil one, the liar, the murderer. For this cause, he that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. And then for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. 
Now, back in verse 5, it gave us one reason why Jesus came, and it said that he came to take away our sins. And thank God for that. And now we find another reason here in verse 8. Jesus was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil, which is those sinful things, those evil things. Now, we know Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. And we're, we're thankful that he found us and we found him. Another reason Jesus came, first John chapter 18, verse 37, it says, For this cause, Jesus talking to Pilate, came I into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. So Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Then he came to be a standard for what's right and wrong. So he's the standard. He's the right. Anything against him is the wrong. Um, all unrighteousness is sin. Jesus is the righteous one. You go against anything that's righteous, it's sin. So there's this... this Balance laid out, right and wrong, dark and, and light, heaven and hell. But then it says here, he came to destroy the works of the devil, which is everything counter to the work of God. So the purpose, Jesus Christ came as we're in him. Uh, I read a story about a um, hundred-year-old man. He was interviewed by the newspaper because of this event, making it to hundred years old. And they asked him, you know, what's your reason, what's your... Uh, Success. Why, what would you say that would be the greatest thing to help people to know how they can live that old? And he said, well, one thing, he says, I don't have any enemies in the world. And the reporter, he said, well, that's, that's a great thing, I, very inspiring. And, and then, then the old man finished his statement. He said, yeah, I don't have any enemies in the world. I've outlived them all. And, <laughs> You know, everyone has enemies, right? You know, bugs have enemies, the birds and the birds, the cats and the cats, the dogs and the dogs, the dog catcher and humans. Our enemy is the devil. He's an enemy and his works are sin. And he wants to get us to follow his ways instead of God's ways. So again, you know, this, this goal that we've been talking about, lining up our flesh man with the spiritual man is what God wants us to do. But just getting in our heads, we just need to be looking at something and saying, that's yucky stuff. If God would help us to see sin as yucky stuff, Amen. instead of fun stuff, yeah. instead of neat stuff. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, and then verse 9 kind of puts a little interlude in this thing, this doctrinal teaching. And then verse 10, we'll go back to this first thought. But look over at 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, and we'll study the Bible a little bit here as we look at this passage that's so confusing to people. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So... Several bad teachings come out of this verse, mainly because people are following a bad Bible and not rightly dividing the truth. People would say, first of all, well, if you're saved, obviously from 1 John 3, 9, you won't sin. Because it says in the verse, who's born of God doth not commit sin. Or people will say, it doesn't say this in this verse, it might say it up in verse 4 and, and verse 6, but in this verse, it says if you're born of God, you don't sin. That's what it says. It's black. It's, doesn't it say that? So then people will say, well, it really doesn't mean what it says. It means if you're born of God, you're not going to practice sinning. Or you're not going to be a regular sinner. Or the, the ESV Bible perversion says this in this version. It says, and that's a very popular version now, I guess. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, is what they say. New American Standard says no one who's born of God practices sin. NIV says they can't go on sinning. Look, look over at chapter 5, verse 16. It's bad doctrine. <laughs> I mean, 90% of the commentators will teach from this verse, well, it really doesn't mean you can't sin. It means that you won't habitually sin if you're saved. You, you, you won't practice that in your life. Verse 9 of chapter or verse 16 of chapter 5, here's the same writer saying, if any man see his brother, as a Christian, sin a sin. So this verse says a brother can sin a sin. 
1 John chapter 1 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth isn't in us. But we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who's the propitiation of our sins, right? Not for ours only, but for those of the whole world. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So, well, we'll, see, well you know, I'm just, I'm just a fruit inspector. And if someone continues in sin, obviously it's an evidence they're not saved, isn't it? Well, <laughs> the Bible didn't say you'll be saved if you don't continue in sin. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So this doctrinal thing we need to understand first of all. So it says in the verse, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he's born of God. So we need to understand what it means to be born of God. And there's, there it is. We talked about this supernatural, amazing love of God last night about being uh, made sons of God. Okay? So this body, though, is, is still a, a seal, so to speak. If you were here last night, it's, it's not changed. This body is still flesh. Nothing, nothing happened in this flesh when I got saved. It, it's still... Old Nicodemus... Was, was the first not to understand it. Go look over there at John chapter 3 and put your bookmark over in 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll go there first. Oh, Nicodemus saying, what? You know, I, do I, I'm going to be born again. Jesus said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus says, well, can I crawl back into my mother's womb? How can this thing be? Not understanding the spiritual dimensions of it. Supernatural. First, look at 1 Peter first, if you would. 1 Peter chapter 1. So our text said, you know, if you're born again, you don't sin. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. 1 Peter 1, 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So, I was born again, but I didn't get that second birth from human seed, right? See it? I got that second birth from an incorruptible seed, the word of God. It lives and abides forever. So it's not me that lives and abides forever. It's the word of God, and I got life from the word of God, from Jesus Christ so whosoever is born of God then doth not commit sin. Oh, so you mean a Christian doesn't commit sin? No, that, that's not what he said. He, he said whosoever is born of God, your soul man is born of God, your flesh man is not. Look over at John chapter 3 then. Where Brother Carlson and I were studying for this text, so we have this laid out good for you too. John 3. Verse 6, this Nicodemus we're talking about. Verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water, physical birth, and of the spirit, spiritual birth, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. So that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Your old body, your old sin nature, that which is born of the flesh. It hasn't been saved. It hasn't been redeemed. It's what it always is. It can do anything that it always did before. It's still flesh. It's still the Adam man. Uh, that's why there's this battle between the flesh and the spirit, between the natural man and the spiritual man, between the, the Adam man and the born again man. Galatians 5 says, The flesh lusteth after the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another, this battle. Romans chapter 7. Romans 7. Yeah. 
Apostle Paul, certainly a born-again man, but man, he still battled this flesh. He said in verse 22, well, let's just read that little tongue twister that he said over there in verse 19. For the good that I would do, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do, if I do that, I would not. It's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil's present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And thank God he has an answer. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Yeah, see the battle going on? That's exactly what 1 John 3 is talking about. This this old man, this new man, the inner man, the flesh man, the body, the soul, the, the sinneth, the sinneth not, the body of death, the born again, this battle going on in our lives. So, so well, what's born of God then? Look, we'll look at one more verse. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. So the verse says that we're trying to identify and explain and expound that that which is born of God sinneth not. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39, Hebrews 10, 39. But we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Is your soul saved? Yeah, well, praise the Lord for that. Then It's been saved by incorruptible seed, and His seed remains in you, and because it remains in you, you can't sin. You're born of God, spiritually speaking. So do you know why your soul stays saved? Your soul says it can't sin. It's made the righteousness of God in Him. So you have eternal security. It has no effect on what this body does. Your soul has been born again. It's life from God. It's the life of God, the divine nature. Hallelujah for it. The Lord Jesus Christ, I am in Him. He's in me, one and in, in together. And you say, well, oh, preacher, what if I do this? Or what if I do that? And I, 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 This thing? <laughs> this body? Man, it's a mess. Yeah. This seal? Oh, it, well, it's a mess. It's not saved. This body. You're looking at the covers of a book here. The inside, praise the Lord, it's, it's perfect, and, but not the contents. I like the concept of spiritual circumcision. You think about this thought that the, the, the soul and spirit of man is cut away, separated from the effects that this flesh is going to have on us eternally speaking. I mean, the Word of God is quick and powerful, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, comma, and the joints in the marrow. It didn't say soul, comma, spirit, comma. Soul and spirit's cut away from the joints in the marrow. Colossians 3 talks about this operation made with, uh, without hands, this supernatural thing. But my born again, my inner man is in Christ. I'm saved. I'm his seed, his supernatural child. No condemnation, no works of mine. All because of this spiritual truth, born again. So we need to understand what born again means. Eventually, the goal is one day... 1 John 3, 2 says, we shall be like him. We'll see him as he is. But right now, it's a battle in this body to strive to be like my soul is. Yeah. Look over at, uh, at uh, Psalm 32. Your flesh isn't born again. Your soul is. Your inner man is. And if it walks after the Spirit, it's walking... Walking after Jesus, your, 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 your body. Psalm 32, interesting verse. Just drive this point home. Look, there's a danger of cutting up the Bible and saying, well, it really doesn't mean that, or this doesn't mean that, or it should really. It means what it says. Psalm 32. Psalm 32. 
Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Now we'd say that. Whose sin is covered. Now ours are taken away. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. No, he imputed his righteousness. And in whose spirit there is no guile. Now, you know what it said about the sinless Lord Jesus Christ in 1 Peter 2.22. It says about Jesus, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. So as our spirit, we become like Christ. If you are born again, you have Jesus's righteousness in Imputed into us. Born again. As we flip back to 1 John to finish, look over at 2 Corinthians 5. So you need to understand this dual nature of man, the, the position that we have. The standing that we have as Christians, we're born again, our soul is saved, it's, it's redeemed, it can never be lost, it, it becomes the righteousness of God in Him. But then the difference between that and the practice and our, our state, as, as Brother Ray mentioned last night. 2 Corinthians 5, okay? Y'all hungry? All right. <laughs> Someone said, I have a New Year's resolution. I'm going to lose 10 pounds this year. I only have 15 more to go, and that's what happens, if you know what I mean. The better resolution is, my resolution is for all of my friends to gain 10 pounds, and then I look skinnier than everyone else. That's better. All right. Second Corinthians chapter 5. So this is a great verse, and we're all familiar with it, but notice something that we want to kind of change the Bible again. It says in verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, understanding the term in Christ, that salvation term, born again term, spiritual, soulish term, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. All things. Your flesh isn't yet part of that yet. Oh, well, all doesn't really mean all. No, all means all. So you have to understand there's a difference in, in this born-again spirit and soul than your body which is waiting for the redemption. <laughs> All things aren't going to become new to us until our bodies are completely regenerated. But our soul is experiencing it now. So that's 1 John 3, verse 9. Now go on. So 1 John 1 is talking about the flesh. I need to confess my sins in the flesh, and you know I, I still sin. I need to get right with God. Right. Chapter three is talking about the soul here, and then it goes back now, telling us, okay, so you understand you have a saved soul, but in verse, as as Brother Carlson talked about, we're trying to line up this practical part of ourselves with the with the position that God's put us in. First John three ten. Now he go, then he goes back. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth his brother. So there's a difference between a person who is living a life of God or a person who is living the life of the devil. All right, so there's, there's this balance type thing we're trying to, trying to figure out. Someone said the, the reason a Christian ought not marry a non-Christian is because you're going to have trouble with your father-in-law, spiritually speaking, right? We're talking about the devil. So there's a great verse in Colossians chapter 3, verse 4 that says this, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear. When Christ, who is our life, so if something is your life, then that's the way that you're going to follow that thing. So is Christ, your lifestyle should reveal your life. So we understand our soul is saved, and hallelujah, I can't lose this salvation, wonderful thing. And so as Brother Carlson said, you can go on track A and understand that my soul is saved, and I'm, I can't lose my salvation, and you know God's going to forgive anything that I do, and I'm going to get to heaven. And that's all true. But as Brother... Ray said, I don't want to be ashamed at his coming. 
So the, this thought is my lifestyle should reveal my life. Who's my life? Is Christ your life? Isn't that a verse, a challenging verse? When Christ, who is our life, shall appear. Who's our life? Which nature will you walk in? God wants us to walk in the new nature. Not following the sin, not following the devil who's a destroyer and a, destruct, and, and, and a murderer and a liar. So God, may God help us. God, help us to see the, the, the things in this world as devilish and hurtful and ugly and dirty and harmful. There's a story told about a guy who took his family out to a drive to the beach, see the ocean and this and that, and then the sign come up and he's on this narrow road and, and there's cars behind him and they're going this, and the sign came up and said, naturalist area ahead. And he said, oh no, I know what this means. He said, I got to turn around and get out of this thing as he's going down the beach and going, and, and then, uh, oops, too late, here comes four people riding along on a bicycle. And he says to his kids, kids, don't look, too late. They said to dad, dad, those people aren't wearing helmets. Because they're following what dad said, and dad said, don't wear him. Where's your focus at? It's your focus on following the law and following what the heavenly father says. And that's what we need to be doing. If you're sinning, you're following the old man, you're supporting the devil. If you're living righteous, hallelujah, you're trying to follow God and obey him and not hurt him. The goal, get this flesh to conform to the saved spirit. Or as Brother Ray beautifully put it, man, let's get our practice up to where our position is. Right? Yeah. It just repeats it over and over in this Bible. Chinese boy wanted to learn about jade, the gem, and, and he, he went to study with an old talented teacher, and the teacher put a piece of jade in his hand. He said, I want you to hold this, I want you to just feel it and just hold it in your hand. And then the teacher, so the boy's waiting to learn about Jade, and the teacher started talking about philosophy and what's going on in the world and relationships and men and women. He talked for about an hour and then took the piece of Jade back and he said, okay, I'll see you next week. Next week the boy comes back, the, the, the teacher put the piece of Jade in his hand, covered it up, and then he started talking about what's going on in sports and how's the nature and how's your family doing and this and that. And, and the boy's getting kind of frustrated. Same thing happened for several weeks. But the boy's too polite, didn't want to question this master teacher. One day he comes for his lesson several weeks later, and the, the teacher puts the piece of jade in his hand. And the first thing the boy said, he said, that's not jade. No, the apostle John wants us to walk so cr close to Christ that when something is in our lives and we've seen in the Bible and we've sensed the Holy Spirit and we say, that's not right. That's not what God would want. That's of the devil, or as we can remember, that's yucky stuff. God, thank you for your Bible. Thank you for the instructions you give us doctrinally. Lord, it's sure good to know this great doctrine, but Lord, you just didn't leave it there. You give us practical advice. So help us, Lord, not to choose the devil over God. Help us to hate that, to realize what a wicked thing it is and hurtful. Thank you for this church, God. Would you bless these dear people? Thank you in Christ's name. Amen.